It is 3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. Investors trying to shake off the tough start to the year. Markets are mixed heading into the final hour of trading with the Dow leading the way. Tech is still under pressure as Apple gets hit by yet another downgrade. But Apple bull Dan Ives is here with why he says it will be the first $4 trillion company. Plus, Eli Lilly taking its drugs, including weight loss medications, straight to consumers. The pharma giant launching a new service to enable users to order ZepBound directly. And the news weighing on many telehealth companies. Plus, Peloton shares riding higher on a deal with TikTok. It's the first time that Peloton content will appear outside of the fitness company's own channels. We've got the latest on their partnership. Let's get you up to speed on the market action now. Now, as I mentioned, we are seeing a mixed picture here into the close of trading today. Right now, the Dow is gaining about 109 points, uh, but the S&P very slightly lower. The Nasdaq pulling back by about a quarter of 1% here as we see this kind of... A, you know, attempt to sort of find footing for stocks as we kick off 2024. Yeah, it has been bumpy for the market. You know where also it's been bumpy? It's been bumpy for the Magnificent yes. Shuli. Magnificent Julie? Magnificent yeah. Julie. Yeah. It's not been bumpy oh, for the Magnificent yes, Julie. It's been fantastic <laughs> for the Magnificent Julie. Like Magnificent that. Seven on you the other end. That's a new be, expression. It's going to be a great show. It's going to be a great show. Let's start there. Magnificent Seven, Magnificent Julie, whatever you want to say. Shares collectively headed for a fifth straight day of losses, shedding billions in market value. Apple has been hit the hardest in the new year. That's wiping out more than $160 billion so far for the iPhone maker. So let's start there because iPhone's interesting. So Piper downgrades, right? This follows Barclays. They downgrade. I don't want to overstate it, by the way, because listen, if most analysts covering this name, more than 60% still say this one's a buy. But it is interesting to see some big analysts saying, you know what, I'm stepping to the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Overall, you can understand where the skeptics are coming from. It had a tremendous run in 2023. And there's some questions. I mean, you've had four straight quarters of declining sales. Mm -hmm. They've had, you know, you look at China, shaky, right? I also think another big theme here, Julie, is just AI. AI is the name of the game for tech investors. They want to know what your story is. And obviously, a lot of tech companies have been responding, right? They've been putting money and time and effort into that tech. They've been integrated across their portfolios. For AI, when it comes to Apple, there's whispers, there's rumors, but I don't think anybody's really sure what exactly they have planned. Maybe you hear, maybe we'll hear something, a big software show in June, but I think that's also contributing to some skepticism now creeping in here. Yeah, and then the note today, uh, that downgrade you mentioned from Piper Sandler said they're concerned about handset inventories, that in fact unit sales may have peaked in terms of the growth rates for unit sales. To broaden it out a little bit and talk about the Magnificent se uh, Seven for a little bit more for just a moment here, five straight sessions down for that group collectively, right? So big, big year last year when the group more than doubled collectively, and now seeing that little bit of a pullback here, it's off in the neighborhood of 4% if you average those seven names. So Apple has sort of led the way but it has been broader than that in terms of the weakness that we have seen uh, within this group so far. Yeah, I mean, listen, in 2023, if you stuck with those names, you were feeling good, you're feeling smart. Some questions now about, you know, whether you stick with those winners in the new year or do you trim, you know, heading in. Yes, I think a lot of people are asking themselves yep. that. All right, well, while Wall Street is turning sour on Apple, our next guest has a bull case for the tech, tech giant and a $4 trillion valuation call for 2024. Joining us now is Wedbush Securities Managing Director and Senior Equity Analyst, the one and only Dan Ives. We'll get the shoe cam later. We will have the Great. shoe cam later, but for now, we just have, we have awesome. you, you rose to the challenge oh, for yeah. us. We oh, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. ready, ready to rock it. Dan, yes. let's start there. You heard us chatting Apple. So it has this tremendous 2023. There are some of your colleagues on the street maybe getting a little skeptical. Their checks, you know, their own independent checks show maybe some weakness in iPhone demand. You heard me talking to Julie. I mean, I think there's nervousness about uh, China as well, you know, looking shaky. Again, also you heard, you know, the AI story, people mm -hmm. not exactly sure what the story is, what could be coming, but you say no, stick with this name, you still got to buy in 2024. It's the movie Groundhog Day, right? I mean, if you go back a year ago, many of the haters were saying the same thing. 
Apple's going a lot lower. This is going to be the, and then the stock's up 50% because they continue to underestimate Cook and Cupertino. You're talking about the, the golden install base, 250 million iPhones right now, a window of an upgrade opportunity. We spent a lot of time in Asia, and I'm telling you right now, we are not seeing any sort of major cuts from the supply chain. Now, I'm not saying that this is roses and rainbows in China, but they are holding their own, gaining share. And I think this is a get out the popcorn moment as the stock sells off yet again. And I think ultimately a year from now, $4 trillion market cap. And the watch issue, non-issue, or do you think it, it is something that is going to provide a little rockiness here? Look, I think from a revenue perspective, it's really breadcrumbs. Now, I think it does speak to patent issues that they're going to run more and more into from a healthcare perspective. But again, if you look at where this is all heading, the innovation, you talk about AI, you know, I believe they continue to play chess, others play checkers. This is about an AI app store we expect to get announced over the next year. That's going to be more- Wait, what is an AI app store? So there's going to be a separate, now it starts with Vision Pro from a form factor. And now many of you, 3,500, it's not going it's all about, and Josh knows as well, it's about developers. This is just setting the stage for what this is, the new form factor is going to look like in the next two, three years. Developers are the key. They're going to be building more and more AI apps from fitness to content to health that are going to be on the App Store. That's really going to be Apple's opportunity to further increase that services business. Services is a key of the re-rating that we are seeing in Apple. I think you go back a few years ago, 200 billion. Today we think it's worth 1.4 to 1.5 trillion. That is the key to where I believe this narrative is going to change over the next six to nine months. And you don't see that because just sticking with that, you know, faster growth, higher margin services story. Some of the skeptics I know, part of their downgrade was we think that's decelerating. You don't see that. Sure, many of the, look, many bears, you know, they never thought Apple would hit a trillion, trillion and a half, two trillion. So the point is like, the haters will continue to hate. They view it as a hardware company. We view it as disruptive tech in terms of the install base. Services, it's a teenager type of growth now. Mm. You look at the margin, what's happened there. iPhone's gonna grow again, even when you think take out currency. China's growing. And I think as this plays out, 225, 230 million units. And, and if that happens, I think many of the bears are gonna be looking at this period, being like, how was I wrong yet again <laughs> in Apple? <laughs> and Dan will be over here, patting himself on the back yet and, again. And, and, <laughs> and I would say, and Julie, it's not necessarily patting himself, it, it's really, it's trying to handhold investors. The, you know, out of the central casting, fire in a crowd theater first day or two of the trading year, those are predictable type of downgrades, scare every, and, but ultimately for us, it's about what our checks show us. We firmly stick with, yeah. I think a year from now, this is gonna be a lot higher. When you, when you say doing those checks too, I'm just interested in, and you, in your checks indicating maybe iPhone demand is holding up, do you have any line of sight, Dan, into what they're buying? I mean, when people are making those, are they, are they looking at those higher margin pro models? Well, and that's it. I mean, we're seeing a lot of pro models in China. That mix is huge from an ASP perspective. ASPs could be up $100 year over year. And I think the pro mix, we think it's 75, 80% versus a historical 60%. That's huge for ASPs. And that's why we rely on our supply chain checks. That's really navigated us over the last year. And I think Apple's a name you got to call by having feet on the ground in Asia, not from, uh, you know, 10th floor of an office building in Park Avenue. Mm. Um, let's broaden it out a little bit because one of the questions we've been talking about a lot in the first days of the year kind of holding over from last year is where else are we going to see the opportunity in AI, right? Who else is going to be making money from this besides just NVIDIA? Um, and I know that you've had some calls on some companies before. Palantir is one of the ones you're very excited about. What's going to be the name that's going to benefit the most this year? Yeah, because I area? think to your point, I mean, it was just the godfather of AI, Jensen, NVIDIA, as well as what Nadella has done, Redmond with the mm -hmm. trophy case. This year, it's going to be about the rest of tech. I mean, when you look at software and chips, I think they lead tech higher. And you look at some of these names like MongoDB, the Messi of AI, Palantir. I look at names like Snowflake, that's another one you're seeing sentiment get much more negative. You, what this is gonna do to the chip sector in terms of this cycle, that could ultimately, I think a lot of these chip needs, you're also gonna see M&A significantly. And then you look at the install base plays. What's Benioff doing at Salesforce? Look at Adobe, look at Oracle. It's one where we believe it's a 1995 moment. It's the biggest tech transformation in the last 30 years. This is not hype. 
And I think this is really the start of a fourth industrial revolution. We believe the new tech bull market has begun, despite the bears you know, winning a few battles the first few days of the year. Palantir's an interesting one. So the messy of AI. It's the messy of AI. Uh, I'm not a big soccer guy, but I feel like you're saying something positive. <laughs> Let me ask you about how it was a monster 2023 for Dr. Alex Karp and that crew at Palantir. But you say stick with it. It's still a buy in 2024. The best pure play. Why, AI why do you say that? Dan? Because from when, the work that we do from a use case perspective, mm. they're the first call. In other words, everyone focused on government, what they've done there, maybe some of the controversies. The reality is that they've leveraged that government expertise into enterprise. You look at AI. So you see, the, you see the commercial just keep on growing. I, right yeah. now, you don't see a major AI deployment where Microsoft, Palantir are not at least tip of the tongue in terms of some of these use cases. And that's our view. Our view is some will say Palantir is expensive, it's hype. This year they prove it. And I think that's the key as this all plays out for what I continue to view as stock that could ultimately double over the next 12 to 18 months. You've mentioned Microsoft in passing a couple of times, so I, I want to come back to that one. When does Microsoft actually start making money from AI, right? There's a lot of buzz around it, but it's not, there's no, there's nothing flowing to the bottom line at this point from it, right? I think late January, you know, once, when we look mm -hmm. at earnings, the, I think the aha moment is going to be the monetization that comes from Copilot for Microsoft sooner than many are expecting. We think for every 100 hours of cloud spend, our partners are telling us 35 to 40 incremental for AI. And that's our view from Microsoft. This is going to get, uh, this is a stock that's going to get re-rated. And, and ultimately, the street could be underestimating cloud growth by 20 to 25 billion as you look out into 2025. I'm not saying that they're going to pound the sort of table with massive guidance coming out of the gate. They're going to continue as the tactician Nadella does under promise and over deliver. All right, Dan. Thank you so much. Fun no, stuff. Stick around, here. by the way. We're going to come back to you a little bit later in the hour for some of your picks in the ride sharing sector as part of Goodbye or Goodbye. Can All we? All right, stick around. After a nearly five month search, the St. Louis Federal Reserve has a new president. Jennifer Schonberger is here with the details. Hi, Jen. Hey there, Julie. That's right. The St. Louis Federal Reserve announcing today that Alberto Musalem will be its next president, giving him a seat on the all-important interest rate sitting committee. As president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve, Musalem will join other regional Fed Bank presidents as a voting member on the FOMC, though he will not have a vote until 2025. The 55-year-old, who will start in his role on April 2nd, has previously worked as executive vice president and senior advisor to the president of the New York Federal Reserve and as an economist for the IMF. Most recently, he was CEO and co-chief investment officer of Invince Asset Management, a quantitative investment technology company that he co-founded back in 2018. Musalem also holds a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's and bachelor's degrees from the London School of Economics. Musalem takes over after Jim Bullard stepped back back in July after serving as president for the St. Louis Fed for 15 years. He's now dean of the business school at Purdue University. Back to you. Jennifer Schonberger, thanks so much. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, our latest video series, Lead This Way, features conversations with some of Wall Street's best. In the 4 p.m. hour, we'll have an interview with former PayPal CEO and President Dan Schulman. And a new installment, as mentioned, of Goodbye or Goodbye. We're putting the two rideshare giants, Uber and Lyft, head to head with Wedbush's Dan Ives. Stay tuned, much more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
still about 40 minutes to the closing bell. Let's take a look at a few of today's top trending tickers. Starting with shares of Peloton rising after the company announced a partnership with TikTok to create a fitness hub on the social media app. So the idea here, Julie, obviously, listen, you can hope they find a whole bunch of new customers if you're Peloton. Available apparently US, UK, Canada. The backstory here, we know when we talk about Peloton, we were talking about a pandemic, you were darling, uh, faced a tougher backdrop, right? As folks are now clearly, you know, they're back at the gym. So it's tried different approaches and strategies. It launched that tiered membership pricing last year, deals with different brands like Lululemon, try to jumpstart revenue as well. But maybe this helps boost subscribers. TikTok is a monster. So if you're bullish on Peloton, I guess that's the hope. Is anybody bullish on Peloton? I mean, yes, there is some bullishness out there on Peloton, but man, when you say it's had a tough, tough few years, it has yeah. really had a tough few years. It's down for three straight years, right? It peaked back in December of 2020 at 162.72. As you can see, the stock yeah. today, even with a big gain, is trading a little over six bucks. So it has really had a tough time. And Peloton has really tried a lot of different things to get the numbers back up. It's tried these partnerships. We'll see if it actually starts to bear out in the numbers. I don't know, do you have a Peloton? I don't have a Peloton. No, I never got it. I tried the app no. very briefly and it wasn't it wasn't my just, thing. It, it, my, my you know, either. so I, I just, you know, will this actually cause more people to sign up? Will it cause more growth for the company? I think the next earnings report and the commentary around that's going to be real interesting. Yeah, and to your point, the stock is a mess. Yes. I mean, it's had more than 30% in just the past 12 months, if you want to take that time. You, a lot of times that, of course, brings people in. You think, well, you know, a lot of bad news must be pricing at these sure. levels, but actually most in the street are still on the sidelines, despite that slide. Yeah, definitely, and it's still got a decent amount of short interest yep. as well, which tells you something. Uh, let's talk about shares of battery manufacturer QuantumScape. They are soaring today. That follows a successful endurance test that Volkswagen Group subsidiary PowerCo ran. Uh, QuantumScape significantly exceeded the requirements for the test. That's according to PowerCo. It completed more than 1,000 charging cycles. Now, a little bit of like interesting mechanics here, not when it comes to the actual mechanics of the battery, but this news was actually out yesterday morning, mm -hmm. and the stock fell 3%. And then all of a sudden, everybody n noticed the news, yeah. I guess, and today the stock is up 45%, so that's kind of interesting. I mean, this is another name um, that is pretty heavily shorted here. It's about 17% afloat, so you definitely have a short squeeze effect here. But there's also the hopes by the part of investors that you're going to have these advances in these batteries. Yeah, to your point, and Bloomberg point out here, just, just by way of background, it is actually among the 25 most ah. shorted stocks in the Russell 1000 index. Not a lot of love on the street exactly one by. I mean, there is this, you know, obviously it's speaking to this kind of broader trend. We see EV battery makers trying to bring, you know, new tech to market to power the vehicles more efficiently. So that's the theme here. But yeah, heavily shorted name here for sure. And, and by the way, this isn't just a battery maker. It is trying to develop solid state batteries. Batteries right now have liquids in them, electrolyte and a separator. This would replace that with a solid separator. Mm -hmm. Um, they haven't gotten it to work at scale yet in order to be able to scale up uh, these types of batteries. So that's what's under a progress here. Sort of adding to the weirdness of this move, for lack of a better term, QuantumScape actually mentioned this result on its last earnings call, but it didn't say who the partner didn't was. Name it, right. But Volkswagen's the biggest shareholder in the company. Which I actually did not so know. I, I, I don't think know. I knew it either, but you would think you could extrapolate that yeah. maybe, but I don't yeah. know. Maybe people are just looking for a reason to get into the name here could today. Could be. All right, let's check out one last one here. Shares of energy company APA sliding today following news. They agreed to buy Callan Petroleum in a deal valued at around $4.5 That's expected to close sometime in the second quarter. So that's the news, buying the shale oil driller for $4.5 including debt. That's $38.31 per share. Uh, the CEO is saying here, Callan has a strong portfolio in the Permian Basin, complimentary, uh, saying to their existing assets. And of course, this is a theme now we've talked a yeah. lot about, Julie. I mean, these oil producers moving in, buying rivals, looking for new places to, to drill, drill, drill. Yeah, and what's interesting with um, APA here, formerly known as Apache, by the way, um, is that it is um, exploring some other offshore um, areas of oil, including in Suriname, but those, uh, according to what I'm, the analysis that I've been seeing, those take a while. And so in the meantime, the stuff in the Permian, it, it just hits quicker, right? It's profitable more quickly. And so that then would give, in theory, APA some um, quicker cash flow 
while it is waiting for the longer term stuff to, to work. Yeah, it's always interesting. There's always an interesting dynamic too because so many, a lot of investors in oil names because they want the capital turn. Yes. They want the dividend. They want the yes. check in the mail every quarter. Yes. So it's interesting watching these companies try to balance kind of those exactly. competing interests out for sure. All right. Interesting, as you would say. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Markets mixed today as stocks attempt to shake off a rough start to the year, but with a lot of optimism already baked into the markets, is it fair to ask if investors are overly confident for 2024? Let's bring in Emily Rowland, John Hancock, Investment Management Co-Chief Investment Strategist. So Emily, it is great to see you. Listen, it's been kind of a, a bumpy start to the year here, Emily. Do you think, listen, that's that's kind of expected after the rip we saw in Q4 or no, maybe this is a, the start of something more serious. Yeah, I think it's to be expected. I mean, the last couple of months of 2023 was just unbelievable. The amount of multiple expansion that we saw, the exuberance that we saw uh, during this Fed pivot party. So essentially starting in the, the November Fed meeting, we started to see the more dovish turn from the Fed. And that was confirmed in December with more cuts priced in or seen in the statement of economic projections for 2024 and markets just absolutely loved it. We saw rates coming down, risk assets rally, huge multiple expansion. I think there's some oversold conditions there that are likely to be digested uh, coming into this year. So it's almost like we had the pivot party and now it's kind of the hangover to the pivot party. Maybe we call it dry January. Um, so just kind of a slower start here to the year after so much overindulgence to end 2023. Not that I can relate. <laughs> Emily, none of us can relate to that. <laughs> of course not. Emily, it's great to see you, by the way. Happy New Year to you. you it's too. been a while. Happy New Year. Um, so how long does this hangover last? Does it last for all of dry January, so to speak? Um, you know, and when do we get sort of a better equilibrium in pricing and expectations? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few catalysts here along the way. Of course, tomorrow we've got the jobs report. So we'll look for further confirmation that the Fed can uh, start to look at at least cutting rates into the latter part of this year. Um, we've got another CPI report, of course, coming out. So we'll want to see continued disinflation in the pipeline. And then, of course, earnings. You know, last year was unbelievable just to see that not, earnings didn't matter much. Even the macroeconomic data wasn't all that helpful. You look at the leading economic indicators now negative uh, for 17 months in a row. Earnings were flat in 2023 for the S&P 500, yet stock prices, of course, were up about 26 percent on the year. So fundamentals didn't matter quite as much. And I think last year, if it was sort of the year of multiple expansion, maybe this year is the year where earnings come back into focus, where we start to see, um, you know, other kind of more fundamental drivers. Maybe it's looking at income, looking at dividends as playing a bigger role in portfolios rather than just what's going on with the Fed and rates. And Emily, I'm also interested to get your take on valuation just after the rally that we've had. Does valuation still look attractive to you here at these levels? I think valuations are tough. Look, we came into last year at about 16 and a half times forward earnings. We're trading at 19 times forward earnings right now. So we're kind of bumping up on that ceiling that we came up on uh, over the summer last year. And it's just tough to see more multiple expansion from here. You've got to see that earnings growth driver pick into gear here. And, and you know, we think it could happen. I think the challenge, though, is that analysts are now penciling in about 12 percent earnings growth for S&P 500 companies this year. And it's just tough to see where that double digit growth comes from, considering the fact that we have less fiscal support now, we have a much higher cost of capital, and we still haven't contended with the lagged impact of Fed tightening and how that may impact the labor market. So I think 12% to us feels a little bit overly optimistic. We'd be looking for areas of the market which maybe aren't sporting lofty um, valuations, maybe looking at areas like healthcare, utilities, which are both trading at a discount to the market. I think you could see a rotation there into this year. And Emily, you and I talked a lot about bonds last year. And finally, at the end of the year, we saw more of a bond <laughs> rally, which you guys had been looking for. Uh, what does the direction look like for rates and prices uh, as we go into 2024? Yeah, Julie, you reminded me of that a few times, especially on days Sorry. where bond yields were going <laughs> higher last year. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, but, but to your point, one of the things we talked about a lot is how important that income component is 
in fixed income. And, you know, the fact that you can get four or five plus percent owning a high quality bond, even if there were to be some volatility in rates, we still love that income component. And that continues to be the case for us this year. We do see bond yields moving low. Of course, the move we just had was massive. So maybe we're in for a period here of sort of sideways choppy action as far as the rate environment goes. Again, we see signs of disinflation coming down. There always is a risk that inflation maybe picks up given how loose financial conditions are. We'll figure out later if Terrapel meant for that to happen or not. It'll probably be one for the history book. So if we do see a reacceleration in growth, maybe that causes some chop in yields here. But traditionally what happens is that bond yields fall as you head into an economic contraction. We think that same playbook happens ultimately this time, which is why we see fixed income is continuing to do some more heavy lifting in portfolios in 2024. And Emily, we, we did a whole interview here. We almost didn't mention the election, uh, but we are in an election year. <laughs> so I'm just interested, you know, just as a strategist, Emily, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, trying to use politics as an input into making investment decisions is kind of one of the most challenging things to do. And, and we've had a hard time doing it over the years. We've found that business fundamentals matter a lot more. Valuations matter a lot more. The macro economic cycle matters a lot more. And if you kind of look at the last eight years of market returns, it's actually pretty remarkable to look. One would have potentially bet that areas like China would have suffered under the Trump administration. Uh, technology stocks, that administration was relatively tough on tech. Those are the best two performing sectors. You'd think coming into the Biden administration, maybe that energy stocks wouldn't do as well given green energy policies. Maybe financials would take a hit due to some uh, measures around regulation there. Two best performing sectors. So trying to use politics is just fraught with risk here. We would focus more on what's happening with the economy and what fundamentals are telling us. And Emily, finally, we've been asking folks this first trading week of the year about uh, sort of New Year's resolutions for investors. Uh, any Anything that you are sort of thinking through either for yourself and your own strategy or that you would offer to investors on that front? Yeah, sure. So obviously drink more water. That's always everybody's <laughs> New Year's resolution, right? But I think, you know, for investors, I think it's a great time right now to do a little bit of a gut check. We just saw incredible returns. You're seeing a lot of momentum around, you know, allocating to riskier parts of the market. We just saw one of the biggest moves in areas like unprofitable companies and small cap stocks. It's really easy to kind of get caught up in the excitement of reaching for risk here. And it's not that we don't want to participate. We do. We just want to be really mindful of mitigating risk by looking to higher quality and more defensive areas of the market this year. Emily Rowland, pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for Me being too. here. John Hancock Investment Management Co-CIO, thank you. Eli Lilly, the maker of the diabetes and weight loss drug Manjaro, has beefed up its marketing efforts with new, a new direct-to-consumer website. The announcement has caused the stock to pop today as the company says it will, or it actually, it's down right now, as the company says it will simplify consistent access to prescribed medicines for patients. Here with more is Anjali Kamlani. This is quite unusual, is it, it not, is. for a drug maker itself to liaise directly with consumers? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of speculation about why Lilly might be doing it. Uh, on one part, if you look at what the announcement entails, it's looking at the obesity, diabetes, and migraine drugs. These are easy access uh, sort of drugs or, or really high demand areas, of course, with the obesity uh, and diabetes, Monjaro and Zepbound there. So it, it's interesting because it really gives Lilly the opportunity to engage more with consumers, especially cash pace consumers, because those last two, as we know, uh, have run into some insurance coverage issues. So what Lily is offering here is the direct sale and home delivery through Eversana and Truepill. Truepill, if you recall, had a little bit of a skirmish with the law when it was involved with the cerebral Adderall prescription uh, fiasco in 2022. But this is clearly a, a sort of a, a move for recovery for them. Um, and this is only available in the U.S. for right now. So it does open the door for 
you know, really just more engagement. And it is going to be interesting to see how they can scale up. They are applying automatic coupons or, you know, savings cards for those individuals who qualify. That's a play we saw from Amazon Pharmacy not too long ago. And we also know that they're looking to expand this. They did say in a statement to us that the ecosystem will continue to evolve as additional service providers are added. So it couldn't, it may be more than just these two that they can get on board That's to really yeah. expand their reach. It's not as though, Anjali, though, there's any kind of demand issues with these GLP ones. So why, why now? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You're right. It's not, uh, clearly they have more demand that they can deal with. And we know that cash pay is one of the main ways that they get to these customers, especially on the obesity front, which is why we've seen sort of that runaway issue with uh, fakes, as we saw with the Ozempic, its competitor, as well as with the uh, use at Medispas, right? We saw a lot of uh, off-label use, uh, compounded pharmacies using. And so I think this is one way for Lilly to kind of grasp and put their arms around that. They kind of indicated that in an open letter today saying, quote, that Lilly stands against the use of its medicines for cosmetic weight loss. Munjar and Zepbound specifically named are indicated for the treatment of serious diseases and are not improved for and should not be used for cosmetic weight loss. So I think they're really trying to get their arms around this problem while they've already sued several of these spas who have, you know, been selling counterfeit or other uh, Novo Nordisk as well. So I think this is just one way for the companies to handle the situation. Mm. Anjali, thank you so much. Great stuff. And coming up, the latest installment of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. That was a good one. It was. We're putting the two rideshare giants, Uber and Lyft, head to head with Wedbush's very own Dan Ives to break down which to buy and which to avoid. Stay tuned.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're taking a look at two of the most popular rideshare companies in the world, but with key differences for investors to keep in mind. So what's the best way to play this duo? I'm here with Dan Ives, Wedbush Securities Managing Director and Senior Equity Analyst. Thank Great you so here. much for being here. Of course, when we talk about these two companies, we're talking about Uber and Lyft. So let's get to your goodbye, the one that you like here better, and that's Uber here. So the stock has gone up, obviously, over the past year. That's the chart. So let's get through your case here. You say it's monetizing uh, on rideshare and delivery. Obviously, has a bigger business than just rideshare. Well, it's just starting. I mean, yeah. if you look at rideshare, you look at that food delivery business, it's been stable to growing, profitability is increasing. And then ultimately Lyft, that's the little brother, like the little like the little younger brother to Uber. And Uber's just gained more and more share. Peak rides, I believe 2024 is going to be a massive year for Uber, which is why it's our most bullish disruptive tech name and ride share. Okay, so let's get to disruptive tech in a minute. But first, I want to dig a little bit more into the cash flow, the profitability. And we've got a chart looking at that. So here's the historic EBITDA. And then here's where the estimates are on a consensus basis. So that's a pretty big jump up. Look, I think that's how many bears were wrong on Uber because they were looking at the old Uber. If you look what Darren and team have done, like tacticians, they built the profitable model you see it in the results. And look, if you if this continued to go further, it would just show profitability EBITDA gonna to continue to increase. Valuation's compelling. And I believe this is one where the next phase of the Uber story, the growth and profitability, just a phenomenal balance that you just don't get across tech. Um, and you mentioned it is disruptive tech, which is funny here because I don't actually think of Uber anymore as disruptive tech. What's disruptive about it at this point? Well, when you look at ride sharing where everything's going, I mean, I, I could argue autonomous, mm. the software piece, almost a super app concept, similar to what we see in China. Ultimately, I think that's what, what Musk is gonna try to turn X into. You look at Uber, they're just getting more and more share. And then at the bottom of that mountain, looking uphill, is Lyft, the younger brother. And that's why I think Lyft is a name that's really on the opposite side. Uber, I think this is gonna be a trophy case 2024, bull case $80, 67's price target. What do you think is the next sort of disruptive phase for Uber? Is it autonomy? Is it something else that it's adding to the delivery business? What do you think comes I next? I think it's gonna be autonomy. I think autonomous, that's, that's the golden goose, where they're gonna ultimately head in terms of looking down the road to maybe partner on the autonomous side make sure they continue to skate to where the puck's going. Because what they've been able to do from a profitability perspective, narrow. Make, if something's losing money, toss it. But now focus, double down on the areas. And right now, Dara, you know, it's really been almost a Hall of Fame year or two, what he's been able to do at Uber. All right, and we always talk about the risk for the bull case here. You say macro headwinds. If the economy slows down, people aren't gonna be taking as many rides or ordering as much stuff. But the reality for anyone that's been you know, at airports or hotels the last few weeks, it's been a Pillsbury Doughboy soft landing. So unless you could find me a telescope, kind of hard to find that recession, that's why Uber's bullish right here. At the same time, Uber, fee Uber uh, rates have been going higher, have they not? Especially in cities where they've had to lift wages. At what point are consumers going to push back against that? Look, I think they've struck that balance. I mean, if you look, they recognize where they could raise prices. Drivers are so important. They're essentially independent contractors. But it's more and more important to get Uber drivers. That, that was the issue if you go back over the last year or two. And that's why more and more drivers going toward Uber. All right, let's talk about your goodbye then. You're one to avoid. Obviously, it's Lyft. We've been alluding to it, as you call it, the little brother here. That stock has not done as well. And let's go through your bear case here. You say it's losing market share to Uber. By the day. Mm. And, and I think that's been the problem. They're, they're losing ride share from a market share. They're losing the actual drivers, especially peak rides. I mean, it, that's the key. Long distance peak rides. That's where Uber's gained share. And for Lyft, the problem is they're... How do you invest? They're trying to cut costs. They're trying to get the profitability. And I think that's why if you looked up disaster in the dictionary, you'd see this uh, ticker. Ooh, that's a, a harsh there. And you say it needs to cut even more costs now. Look, and, and that's the problem. I mean, they were spending money like a 1980s rock star. 
and they're needing to cut costs, but that's the problem. The stock's up just to be, you call it speculation M&A or the right. stock's cheap. Right. So, but again, okay, cheap, so. cheap in three dollars gets your cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. So I just not, I'm not a believer that this is really the one just to own it because it's cheap. M&A, that's the biggest bull case. I think better chance of me playing uh, for Michigan or Washington National Championship game than that happening. Okay, so, but what could go wrong? Well, maybe. Uh, it, if there's an outside chance, somebody could get, come in and buy it. And again, I'd call that a very, very small chance. I don't like making that speculative bet. I'd rather own Uber. I could sleep well at night or an Uber. If I own Lyft, 3 a.m., I wake it up. We don't want you waking up, Dan. Exactly. All right, well, let's run through this here and kind of give a summary of what you've told investors here. You say here that uh, basically people should buy Uber. They're monetizing that installed base. They're building out eventually this uh, sort of super app concept, if you will. On the flip side, Lyft is little brother. It's just not making money. It needs to uh, cut costs further, and it's not going to be bought. And you go back a year ago, New York City cab driver was bearish on Uber. Look at the stock, the performance it had. This is just the start. So is, is that the counter indicator, the New York City cab driver? New York City cab, and right now New York City cab driver bearish on tech the last few days, and that's bullish. All right, Dan Ives, thank you so Thanks much. For really me. appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on Goodbye or Goodbye. And of course, you, you brought it today, not just with the outfit, but with the shoes. We're doing a little shoe cam situation here as we talked about. I know that uh, Josh called on you to bring the style earlier today oh, and you delivered. Exactly. I have to live up to Josh, you know, to, to yeah. my fashion. It's well, a, that's a tough bar. Well, you, you surpassed it you. easily. All right. That does it for goodbye or goodbye. Tune in tomorrow for an all new episode at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back. D.A. Davidson downgrading Hasbro to, from buy to neutral this week. The move coming after the toy maker cut nearly 20% of its workforce in an industry struggling to reinvent itself post-pandemic. Joining us now is the analyst behind that call, Linda Bolton-Weiser, D.A. Davidson senior analyst. Linda, it is good to see you. So you downgrade Hasbro, you go to neutral, your target, Linda, goes to 53. How come? Just walk us through the argument, Linda, why you decide now is the time to move to the sidelines. Um, uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, there's really three key reasons. I would say um, the tone of the company has really changed and 
I, I would say that happened around the time that I spoke to them um, when they announced their headcount reductions around December 10th or so. And they really made it sound like the growth prospects for the toy business in 2024 were no growth, you know, decline. And I think that was, to me, a different change in tone. And part of that was the idea that there was a COVID pantry load by consumers of toys and that you're kind of unwinding that. That's a little bit of a new narrative. Um, and then secondly, I'm concerned that the street estimates for the first half of 2024 are too high. The, the growth is just too high, both top line growth and the profit growth, the operating profit the street has is over 25% growth for 2024. I think they're gonna guide lower than that. And thirdly, I'm concerned that their cash flow in the next few years, their free cash flow, will not be high enough to make a big enough dent in paying down their debt to get their leverage ratio down as fast as they would like. I think that signals potential risk um, to the dividend. I think there, there's a risk to a dividend cut here. Linda, on the flip side, the company is trying to introduce some new products, some new properties, right? It's trying to follow on the heels of Mattel, come out with some new content linked to some of its existing properties. It also has this new um, AI-powered Trivial Pursuit that uh, one of our producers was playing with today and, and had, had a good time with. Um, is any of that going to help? Um, could that even help enough that the, the stock could recover to some extent? No, I don't think anything that you've mentioned there is really big enough, huge enough to move the needle. And remember, they've taken a step back from uh, being more closely tied to entertainment and content development because they've divested entertainment E1. So they still have Hasbro Studios, but, uh, but recall their Dungeons and Dragons movie uh, in 2023 was not that successful, not, nowhere near the success of Barbie. So right, the most recent thing didn't really prove that they are, are so um, superior at developing that content. Um, so I would, I would say that, no, if anything, they have a really hard comparison in their Wizards and Digital Gaming business because of Baldur's Gate 3 launch, which was in 2023, and that was a very significant contributor. So it's a hard comparison for them for next year. You know, Linda, when I think about toy makers, just help me out here. I almost think of them as um, almost quasi defensive, Linda, in that, I mean, obviously they're consumer facing, they're gonna get hit with a consumer facing headwinds, you know, that get stretched. At the same time, moms and dads, they don't stop, Linda, buying their kids toys, or am I just thinking about this sector incorrectly? No, you're right. Um, I think of toy companies as kind of like soft cyclicals. So when the consumer wallet is kind of pinched, um, maybe they will put fewer items under the tree or less expensive items, but there's always going to be something under the tree. And that was, again, the case this, this year. Uh, but, but what you are maybe seeing happen during COVID, there was very high growth of the toy industry, double digit growth. Um, in the years before COVID, it was five to 7% growth. So it was a very good growing industry, but now we've had a couple of years of flat to slightly down. And I think that's just, again, maybe there is some truth to this unwinding of, of, of COVID, uh, situation, but the good thing here is that kids grow up. And so every three, four, five years, you've got a whole new crop of kids coming into your consumer base. And those kids need new toys, and it all starts all over again. So that's the good thing here about the toy industry. Linda, let's talk about um, Hasbro's big competitor for just a moment, Mattel, right? Even with the monster Barbie year it had, the stock underperformed the market there. So while you are not a huge fan of, of Hasbro in the near term, it sounds like, are you more bullish on Mattel? Um, I do prefer Mattel um, over Hasbro. I think that management execution in the last couple of years has been very strong, and I expect that to continue. Enon Cries has close ties to the entertainment industry, and I think that was those close ties were some of the things that led to the success of the Barbie movie. He got the right people involved. Um, they've they've worked down their debt, and their balance sheet is now pretty pretty clean. And um, there is some indication that without a lot of big entertainment property things coming up in the next year, 
that evergreen toy properties um, that kids play with day in and day out will be the winners. And that means Hot Wheels and Barbie, in my opinion. And Linda, I want to get you out of here, switching gears a bit. Just get your take on a name in the beauty space that I know you cover, Linda. Uh, Elf, which has had just a, an amazing 12 months. I mean, this stock is up 145%, Linda. You still think it's a buy here, though? I do, um, because the company has is rapidly moving up the market share ranks in mass cosmetics in the United States and globally. And they're currently number three in the U.S., and they want to be number one. And L'Oreal and Maybelline are in the top two positions. And if they were to become number one, uh, along with international growth uh, prospects as well, that those opportunities would result in another doubling of their revenue base. So that's why I think there's still a lot of growth left for ELF. Linda Bolton Weiser, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today is a good day to talk about American energy. Domestic oil production at a record high, and the U.S. is now the world's largest natural gas exporter for the first time ever. Who surfaced those fun facts for us? Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here with a look at this. And you have been watching the sort of um, interplay of the U.S. energy industry with the administration, but also the energy industry on its own, which right. has been growing. I mean, let's just look at the basics here. So. Joe Biden is the most vocal green energy president we've ever had. Uh, he made a campaign promise to end fossil fuel. So who would have thought that three years into Biden's presidency, we would be at record production of crude oil, record exports of crude oil, and the same for natural gas, record production and record exports. I don't think anybody, and that is not Biden's doing. That is the market doing what it does. Um, you know, we know fracking in the United States has unleashed all these extra reserves uh, that were unreachable before. Um, energy drillers got completely burned in 2020. Some of them went out of business. A lot of them lost a ton of money because oil prices basically went down to zero. And so they pulled in. They said, we're not just going to flood uh, the market with supply anymore. They were pretty disciplined for a while. But we've had prices, uh, you know, between 70 and 100 for uh, two years. And before that, they were over 100. So that has slowly just coaxed more energy onto the market here in the United States. And honestly, thank goodness, because look what's going on around the world. Vladimir Putin in Russia clearly uh, has tried to weaponize energy and hold the West hostage to Russia's oil and gas supplies, right? Uh, you've got um, OPEC, OPEC plus cartel is cutting supplies. They want to keep the price up. And here comes all this American energy that, I mean, it's a miracle in a way that energy prices, that we've got oil around 72, given what's happening with Russia, given that we have a war in the Middle East, we've got attacks on ships in the Red Sea, and yet oil is around 72. Yeah. It's a normal price, and gas prices are around $3, $3.10 a gallon. That's A lot of that has to do with all this U.S. energy that's mm -hmm. coming onto the market. Are you, are you surprised at all, Rick, that the oil market hasn't reacted more dramatically to that conflict in the Middle East? Because the, the fear was Iran Hamas would spread, but it has spread. It's in Lebanon, it's in the Red Sea. You have Iran backed militia groups, they're attacking US Navy assets, they're attacking commercial shippers. Are you surprised there's not more I, response? I'm not surprised no. because anybody who follows the oil markets is intimately familiar with turmoil in the Middle East. You can't get away from it. Uh, you know, and it it's been worse in the past. I mean, when we were more dependent on uh, Middle East oil from Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and Kuwait and so on. I mean, Gulf War 1990, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think people who follow the oil market know that um, it's in everybody, every oil producer in the Middle East, it is in their interest for the most part to keep the market stable. Now, yes, some of them would benefit if pl prices went through the roof, but some of them would also get hurt because it would be their supplies that are not getting onto the market. Would that be Iran because it does something provocative that br brings attacks on Iranian oil infrastructure? Would it be other Gulf states that can't get their oil out through the Strait of Hormuz? Um, nobody's willing to take the step over there. I mean, yes, we have seen escalation, but we have said not seen that kind of escalation. And there's probably some, you know, deliberate self-interest at work there. So, look, this could this could light off in an instant. You know, if we had one bomb in the wrong place, um, if you know, if something happens that looks like it's going to presage a U.S.-Iranian um, shooting war, all bets are off. I mean, we could have oil at 150 tomorrow easily. Mm -hmm. But. Um, Nobody really wants that to happen, so right. so far it hasn't happened. And just quickly, if we did not see a crimping of the U.S. energy industry over the past few years and under Biden, does that mean that's it? It's, you know, in other words, are we going to continue to see the kind of growth 
that we have been seeing. I don't think so. And, and the other part of the story is that even though we are having record fossil fuel production here in the United States, we are also emitting less carbon. I mean, this trend of reduced carbon emissions in the United States is still on track. Um, we are replacing coal-fired plants with natural gas plants and in some cases with wind and solar plants. That's good. So we are uh, moving down the path toward decarbonization. Uh, we're getting more electric vehicle adoption and we're only seeing the beginning of all those green energy incentives that were in the uh, 2022 Inflation Reduction Act. Those are only just starting to come in and that's gonna incentivize tons of new green energy investments. So um, right now, it, it's kind of a Goldilocks market in the, uh, in the United States, in the energy market. It could change, but something's going right. All right, Not enjoy bad. it. Yeah, yeah, enjoy it. Rick, thank you, always great to have you sure on thing. set. And coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves, the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. There's the closing bell on Wall Street. So let's do a check of the markets here. Day three in the books for 2024 in terms of trading. And a mixed picture is what we got today. Continued weakness in tech. And as we've been talking about, now five straight down days for the so-called Magnificent Seven. The NASDAQ off by a half of 1% on the day. The S&P 500 down by about a third of 1%. The Dow in the green just barely up about 10 points. And by the way, when I say the MAG 7 is down for five straight sessions, so too is the NASDAQ composite itself. After getting uh, close to records, the NASDAQ 100 was at a record wow. at the end of the year and then kind of going downward from there. Today, it's actually energy that's the worst performing group within the S&P 500, followed by consumer discretionary and communication services. All right, we saw some weakness today. We also saw some weakness in some trending tickers. We did. Yeah, let's get to those right now. We're gonna start off with shares of Mobileye plunging today after it said it expects a 50% drop in revenue in the first quarter of this year. You can see that down about 25% in today's trade. So the stock cratered. Really, this was this full year revenue forecast, Julie, and it missed and missed badly what the street had been looking for. So looking for now, the, the mobilize says between 183 and 1.96 billion. The street was closer to 2.58 billion. So that's a big swing in the mess relative yeah. to consensus. Uh, remember, of course, Intel spun off this company back in October, still, by the way, has a big stake. And it sounds like from Mobileye, which, you know, Mobileye makes chips and systems that power advanced driver assistance, saying the issue here is really with customers building up inventories. Yeah, it was viewed as really bad news by the yeah. street. Now, there were a couple of analysts, like the folks over at City, who said that it doesn't change the long-term thesis. But then the analysts over at Vital Knowledge said this is a shortfall of epic proportions. It really was a shock, it seems like, 
even if for the longer term bulls, this excess inventory commentary was really a shock uh, for investors in Mobileye. And it didn't just take down Mobileye, by the way, it took right. down other chip makers that also service the auto industry here. Uh, companies like NXP Semiconductor, ST Micro, Texas Instruments, a lot of these stocks also taking a hit in the session here uh, on this because, you know, we've talked a lot about what's going on in the auto industry more broadly, that there is sort of weakening demand. And so that's something that maybe is now being felt by these companies. So. Uh, we'll see what, what continues to happen with Mobileye here after this re-rating. Yeah, the company did say we think customers will work through the supply in Q1, but obviously investors were disappointed. RBC's Tom Narayan, who, by the way, was on the show, yeah. right, he likes this name, put out a note telling his client, still likes the name, keeps his outperform, did, though, trim his target off that news. So he's now at 45, he was at 54. And by the way, that one-day decline for Mobileye yeah. is indeed a record wow. drop yeah. for the stock, just seeing that confirmed. Yep. Also, let's take a look at shares of the drugstore chain Walgreens, down 5% after it announced earnings today, announced cuts to its quarterly dividend to get more cash to grow its business. The healthcare giant said reducing its payout to shareholders to 25 cents a share will help free up capital to build out its pharmacy and healthcare business. And really, like, forget about the earnings for a minute. The dividend cut yeah. is really yeah. the, the big source of disappointment here. And it was a slash to the dividend as well. Even for those who were expecting a dividend reduction, the fact that it was bigger than expected for many was a, a disappointment here. Um, some of the bulls on the street will say, OK, this is good news that they're going to be using the cash to try to grow the business. But nonetheless, um, for a company like Walgreens, it doesn't tend to move necessarily a lot on a day-to-day -day business uh, basis. 5% is a big drop. Yeah, and you know, the backstory is, I mean, obviously this is a company where we've seen some big changes in the C-suite. Yes. We had CEO uh, Roz Brewer departed. There's a new CEO, Tim Wentworth. He's, and he has been making moves. So cost cutting, closing locations, maybe looking to sell the international boots chain. We've seen some reporting on that front. Stock is down more than 30% in the past 12 months. But for most analysts, when you look at their rings, this is still very much a show me story. Most of the analysts covering this one still had a hold right now. And it also sounded like from what the CEO talked about today, that this might not be the last move. He said that the company is evaluating strategic options to drive sustainable long-term shareholder value. So maybe there might be some more moves to come. Yep. And he, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, it was you. Oh, me. Yeah, we're both so excited to get to this next interview. That's the thing. Just jumping at the prompter. Eli Lilly is launching a new digital health care experience. This new website will allow patients to directly order from the drug maker, including its weight loss medicine. Telehealth companies with a foot in the weight loss drug space feeling the pressure today. Shares of companies such as Hims and Hers Health, Weight Watchers, LifeMD, and Metafast all sliding in today's trade. Joining us now, Metafast CEO Dan Chard, along with Life. MD and CEO Justin Schreiber. Uh, guys, welcome both to the show and thank you so much for joining us. And Justin, maybe I'll start with you. You know, we, you know, we talked about the news with Eli Lilly. We saw uh, Justin investors reacting to that news, reacting to the headline. What did you make of that? Did you think that response was fair? Uh, good, good question. Look, we're, my, my philosophy is that a rising tide here lifts all boats. I think that Anything that Eli Lilly or Novo Nordisk can do to improve access and help patients like ours, um, you know, access these drugs that are extremely efficacious and doing so many amazing things for their health is a great thing for our business. So, yeah, I think the move in the in the stock today is is an overreaction. I think it's really important to note that you know there are no there's there's no difference in price for patients that choose to go directly to Lilly. Uh, with the Lilly Direct program, um, our providers or any providers in the country can actually uh, send scripts to this program. So I think it could help our patients um, access drugs when they can't find them at a at a neighborhood pharmacy. And look, we're very, very confident in the platform that we've built. You know, we've built one of the leading virtual primary care platforms in the U.S. We have hundreds of thousands of active patients. We have a very big 50 state medical group that's staffed mostly by full-time providers. We provide incredible health care. You know, the, our GLP-1 business is one of the fastest growing uh, segments of our virtual primary care business. Um, and anything that these drug companies can do to improve access to these medications will help our business. Um, Dan, I want to get to you in a moment, but Justin, first I have another question for you, which is that 
you know, you could have thought by some portrayals of the GLP ones um, that you know it's a magic pill. You take it and that's it. But it sounds to me like what Justin, you guys are teaming up to offer is something that addresses the idea that it isn't just that, that, that you need sort of that suite of advice um, that is more well-rounded than just taking the magic pill. Do I have that right? Uh, I think so. I mean, look, the magic pill, you know, magic pill is, is not a bad way to explain this. I mean, what these medications are doing for patients um, for their, you know, not only helping them lose weight, but for their overall health, for their quality of life, it's incredible. None of us have seen a drug like this in our lifetime. And so, you know, that that's an important thing to point out. But but beyond that, to your point, it's extremely important that alongside of taking this medication or magic pill, as you call it, that patients are making the right diet and lifestyle changes, you know, they can they can help them not only lose the weight while they're on the medication, but then keep the weight off once they're off the medication. And that's the reason that we're so excited about the partnership that we recently announced with Metafast. I mean, now you have one of the leading telehealth companies providing incredible virtual care across the country, partnering with the most robust uh, coaching network that exists. I mean, Metafast has nearly 50,000 coaches that are out there um, that are helping patients lose weight, eat properly, you know, adopt the the right you know lifestyle trends to keep weight off. Together, you know, we think these things will drive long term outcomes for patients, which is what's most important for us. And Dan, I want to bring you in here as well. Just talk a little bit more about this partnership, Dan, and and what it's going to mean for your company and your company's growth in the quarters ahead. Absolutely, um, as Justin said, uh, this is a an amazing time for people who want to get healthy, specifically those who are looking to achieve their healthy weight. Over two thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese. Uh, we as a company started over 40 years ago. We were founded by a physician specifically focused on helping other physicians know how to help their patients with this problem of obesity and overweightness. So we are uh, uh, back to doing that in, with our coach-centered, habit-focused program that uh, now with, the, with this uh, collaboration with LifeMD allows us to create a new model, um, which touches on a few of the themes that, we've, that, uh, that, that have been brought up here, which is that uh, while 96% of the people know that somehow their lifestyle is responsible for some of where they are from a health standpoint, only 17% of them are confident that they can make their lifestyle changes on their own. So bringing together coach, clinician and patient together with these uh, amazing new medications, uh, we believe is going to be a huge game, game changer for the majority of Americans who are seeking a solution that includes making a healthy lifestyle second nature. Um, Dan, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it out there. You know, at some point, if the GLP ones become more available, more um, cost effective for people to buy, et cetera, at some point, does it, put a company like Metafast out of business? No, I think what's really happening is a, a greater awareness of what it takes to be healthy. And uh, lifestyle, meaning specifically what I eat, when I eat, uh, how I exercise, all of these kinds of questions about how I live a healthy life are uh, part of achieving, extra, uh, achieving overall health. So weight loss, is part of the equation, but it's not the full solution. So it's these things together. And uh, and we, we, we have uh, so many of the answers that uh, these patients are looking for as they change their lifestyle and become healthier people. And Justin, bring it back to you. Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Justin, but did you all start um, offering this kind of weight manage management program that, that included the GLP-1s? I think it was earlier in the year, Justin. Um, and so I'm just wondering, um, one, is that true? And secondly, if it is, what if you can give us any insight into how that program is kind of scaling, what kind of the response has been from customers? And do those customers actually, do they stick around, Justin, or do you see a lot of churn? Sure, that, those are all great questions. We launched the weight management offering earlier this year. That was following nearly a two year technology build of our virtual primary care platform. We've, you know, we've never seen demand 
for any product that we or service that we've sold, like we've seen for, you know, for medical care around GLP-1 medications. I mean, it's it's unprecedented. You know, we put uh, approximately 20,000 patients are, are on the platform as of today that have signed up this year um, for our weight management offering, which, you know, which includes access to one of our providers, uh, lab work, um, and, you know, assistance with, you know, either getting your insurance to cover a GLP-1 medication um, or accessing a medication through another pharmacy via a cash pay method. Um, so the business is doing great. We're really, really, we have big expectations uh, for the business in 2024. And we're, we're, and to your question on churn, this is one of the biggest things we're focused on inside of the, inside of the company right now. And it's actually something that our patients are focused on. I, I spent a lot of time with our medical group leadership last week. And, you know, this is something that's coming up all the time now. Patients are hitting their goal weight. They're extremely happy. And our goal at LifeMD is to, to have a long-term relationship with, you know, with as many of these patients as we can, you know, and to help them, you know, with their metabolic health, even after they stop taking a GLP medication. And let's face it, some of these people may need to come back on a GLP-1 medication um, if they gain some of the weight back. So we want to be there for them to, to you know, help them access the medication again if they need it. One of the statistics that we that we often share with investors is around 68% of patients um, that are on our plat have that are on our weight ma management platform for two or two or more months uh, since inception are still active patients on the platform. So the retention's been really strong, but our big focus is you know really thinking through what is a long term, very affordable metabolic health platform look like for patients and we're going to be launching that in the coming months at life md all right well stay tuned justin dan thank you guys both for joining us today appreciate the time thank you thank you still to come new research shows consumers turn to online shopping and search for the best bargains during the holidays more on those numbers when yahoo finance returns
It was a record-breaking holiday season for e-commerce spending. That's according to Adobe. New research showing consumers spent $222 billion shopping online in search for the best bargains, particularly on big promotional days. Brooke De Palma has been digging in to all the details, Brooke. Good afternoon, Josh. That's right. Consumers were willing to put up with perhaps higher prices, but really looking for those discounts during this holiday season. They spent roughly 5% more than they did a year ago from November 1st to December 31st. That blowout number of roughly $222 billion. But that was the largest total season revenue in the past three years. Now, if you take a closer look at the particular days where they spent the most well, those happen to be the biggest discount days. Cyber Monday alone brought in $12.4 billion. Black Friday brought in $9.8 billion. And Thanksgiving brought in $5.6 billion. Now, roughly during that Cyber Five, that five days between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday, is when roughly 20% of that total $222 billion was spent. As consumers really look to buy those discretionary goods that we saw them pull back from, in 2023, electronics, we saw discounts there peak at roughly 31% off the listed price. Toys, roughly 28%, and apparel, 24%. Consumers really here felt like they got a better deal, and that led to an increase in demand. But it's important to note this did not account for inflation within these numbers. And you know I always ask, so you that's why you were, you were prepared. <laughs> um, buy now, pay later was yeah. also a big trend in the data. $17 billion almost. Do we know who were the big winners in that? Yeah, well, well, if you look at the, the, the tickers over the past three months, if you look at the shares of a firm square, PayPal seeing a slight bump. They, that came in total of $16.6 billion. That was up 14% from a year ago. Now, these numbers that you're seeing on the screen, that was from October 1st to December 1st, as this holiday season really was elongated this past year. But if you take a closer look at shares of a firm over the past three months, well, they're up more than 100%. And if you look at uh, shares of Square, also, also up more than 60%. PayPal seeing a slight bump, not as significant as the others here. But this really is building on a larger momentum that we saw pull from the first 11 months of the year as consumers look to alternate options to really make ends meet, but also splurge on those luxury goods that perhaps they weren't willing to, to shell out for. All right. Thanks, Brooke. Appreciate it. Well, let's keep talking about retail now because as online retailers scale back on free returns, shoppers are increasingly turning to resale sites to part with their unworn purchases. Last year, online marketplace Poshmark saw a 16% increase in items sold with the tag still attached and an uptick in sales described as missed returns. Manish Chandra, Poshmark CEO, joins us now with more on the state of the retail resale business. Manish, great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, let's talk about this uh, change, I guess, or at least incremental change in your business. How much are these returns that people are keeping now contributing to the resale on your site? Well, you shared the stats. So, you know, we saw a 30% YY increase uh, for the whole year, but really a 40% increase during just the holiday season uh, when people listed items that had missing tags or sort of missed return or new with tags. And what you are seeing with these numbers is really a change in retail stores policies where they're getting stricter and harsher with the consumers. So consumers are turning to Poshmark to revolve their closet and to trade these returns. We saw a gangbuster uh, holiday season. It was the highest growth uh, part of our year. December was the highest growth month of the year. And most importantly, when we compare it not to 2021 and 22, but if you compare all the way back to pre-COVID days, the seasonality felt extremely normal, uh, which was captured by reporters' comments as well. So it feels like the consumer is getting back to normal spending patterns after a couple of years of disruption. So that's interesting, Manish, because you have, you have some very unique insight into the consumer. And I've, you know, listen, the consumer has proven very healthy and resilient. But we've had, you know, plenty of folks around who are kind of sounding some warning signs here, signs of stress, right? They'll talk about dwindling savings. They'll talk about the resumption of student loan payments. It doesn't sound like you're, you're seeing those signs of stress, though. Well, we saw a shift in spending uh, in 21 and 22 in particular to more things like eating out, travel. And in 23, we are seeing it come back to basics, you know, apparel, back to school, holiday, gifting. So it is feeling like a very normal thing. And it seems that consumer has somehow managed to shake off inflation, which is anyway starting to come down. 
And uh, Poshmark in some ways offers a great place because not only are you saving money, but it's also a place where you can actually make money. I was talking to someone where they sold a few items and used that money to go back and buy some gifts for their friends. Um, I'm curious, Manish, what you think is driving the resale business? Is it value? Is it sort of um, environmental consciousness um, and pushback against fast retail? What are you hearing from your customers about what attracts them to it? Well, if you see the two trends that are driving retail right now, particularly in in, in fashion and re in sort of style oriented categories, it's one is sort of drive towards very, very cheap stuff. So you see direct uh, from Chinese sites like Demi and Xi'an take over on one side. And the second thing is you still want value, but you want quality, you want sustainability. You want to make sure that you're honoring both the planet, your family, but also your budget. And that's where resale is really turning out to be a huge winner because consumers look at our platform and other platforms and resale as both a place to go shop, but also a place to revolve their closet and contribute to this economy. So, so that's really the first thing. The second thing is I think the simplicity of platform is helping. Uh, what we've done, what other platforms have done, making shipping, selling, um, you know, protections, all of that is really, really simple. The third thing in 2023, which has caught us by surprise, is we launched live streaming and video shopping. And that has really taken and, and become a pretty big part of our business in Q4. And Manish, I'm also interested in whether, you know, any kind of measures, strategies, Manish, you're kind of putting in place to make sure that you're not profiting, inadvertently profiting uh, from theft. Oh, theft is uh, something that we've been watched up for a long time. It's something we have multiple measures on the platform. Uh, the, the good thing is that we haven't seen any remarkable changes in sort of the percentage of reports that come in. We have both direct reporting procedures. We cooperate and work with the local law agencies and make sure that anything that is, you know, even suspected of being stolen is both taken down from the site, but then also the individuals are, are connected to the local law enforcement. Uh, Manish, uh, I guess it's a, almost a year to the day that you closed on your sale to Naver, if I'm saying it correctly, the South Korean... Yes. Um, yes. Company, what are some of the changes you have seen? Are, are you seeing different, for example, um, global sales patterns with expansion globally um, under their ownership? Talk us through that. Yeah, so one of the big things that Naver uh, and, and Poshmark really decided to do was a lot of collaboration around deep technology. Naver, as you know, is sort of like have deep tech stack like Google uh, in, in Korea. They've been developing their own language learning models. They have a very deep search stack. And so what we've been doing is partnering with them. We released first collaboration in the form of Poshlands, which is visual search. You should see more announcement from that partnership over the course of the next year. The second thing that has allowed us to do is to really invest in our own technology. So you see us releasing features at a faster clip rate. We've been able to really focus on things like live streaming and live shopping and some of these things that are very, you know, had huge growth in Asia, but have been like a little slow to catch on in America. And we've seen almost like over a thousand percent growth in past shows, our, our video shopping product. Just in the holiday season, there were over a hundred million minutes of, of shows that happen and own four million orders placed through live shopping on Poshmark just during the holiday season. Wow, live shopping, the next wave. Manish Chandra, thank you so much. CEO of Poshmark, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up, the latest episode of our video series, Lead This Way. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi chats with former PayPal CEO and President Dan Schulman. Stay tuned. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Fawcett, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. 
and we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. To me, profit and purpose go hand in hand. Business can be and should be a force for good, but you have to have the confidence to make difficult decisions. Dan Schulman is on the Mount Rushmore of CEOs from the past two decades. He was brought on as CEO of digital payments powerhouse PayPal in 2014 to guide the company through the split with eBay. In his nine years as PayPal CEO, he's taken bold stances on contentious issues and prioritized the financial health of his employees. At his core, the now former PayPal CEO leads with purpose, compassion, and a vision of business being a force for good. I was thinking back on your leadership through the years of PayPal, and one thing among many certainly stood out to me, profits and purpose are not at odds with one another. And to me, that is how you led this company, is that right? Why has that been so important to you? As the CEO of a large company, you have multiple constituencies that you're trying to serve. Shareholders are, you know, one of those. Um, but you need to focus on your employees. That's always been kind of the centerpiece of what I've tried to do as a leader. And so my view is if you want to attract the very best employees, and the very best employees are the bedrock of any company's success, you have to stand for something. And to me, profit and purpose go hand in hand. If you have a mission, a sense of values, motivated and passionate employees, you'll do better over the long run than your competitors who don't have something like that. And you gave them stock. I gave every employee stock in the company so that they would be owners. We raised wages, we wrapped it all in an educational financial literacy program, because I did feel like financial health is sort of the bedrock of my responsibility to my employees. Over the course of his long career, Shulman has taken some of the most iconic businesses in consumer finance, telecommunications, and e-commerce to new heights of growth and prosperity. But there have been some serious challenges along the way. Has it been hard as a leader to take stands on key issues? And then how do you implement those key stands? Well, it's always hard um, to take stands on issues. My view is you need to make stands because if values are just words on a wall, then they're just propaganda. They're not really what you stand for. I think you know, one of the first moments where I realized that is when North Carolina passed House Bill Number 2, which in my reading of the bill allowed for the discrimination against somebody for their sexual orientation or their sexual identity. And I felt like that was anathema to our values. And so we pulled out of North Carolina. I had no idea that it would be front page news of the New York Times. I had no idea the number of death threats that I would get as a result of that. But it's those kinds of stands that are very difficult, but our customers expect that from a responsible corporate citizen. In that moment, what did you learn about yourself as a leader? I go by several attributes that I try and follow um, for leadership. Like one is be humble, admit to yourself you don't know everything and that you're constantly learning and listening. And either you say you're humble or life will force you to say you're humble. One way or the other, <laughs> you need to be humble. Number two is to be generous, to always think the best of people, to always feel like people are um, have best intent uh, possible. And then I think, you know, being authentic is crucial. And that's kind of what I learned in these things. Just like, be yourself. Work on your own set of values and what you are and who you are. And finally, 
You need to be both. You need to be quietly confident. You have to have the confidence to make difficult decisions, knowing some of them will be wrong and some of them will be very right. And that is what moves the company forward. So Dan Schulman, the leader, walking in the first day as CEO of PayPal nine years ago to today, how are you different as a leader? Well, I think I've, you know, grown a lot. I've seen people who had left PayPal for dead, you know, that we were going to be a dinosaur. I think, you know, we are uh, clearly a global payments powerhouse right now. You know, I've probably become more, um, more values driven than ever before. Because I think in this world, you know, you need to have a moral compass that drives your values. You need to feel comfortable with yourself, whether times are going great or not great, because you need to be a very consistent leader. How do you think PayPal employees will remember you? Well, I think they will think of me as a colleague who really cared about them, that tried to take care of them, making sure that they had financial health, that they could dream again about a better life for their kids, and that we were a role model corporate citizen and that they could be proud of the company that we became. And I think the next chapter uh, for PayPal will be even more exciting than the last uh, decade. And that new chapter is already underway for PayPal with new leader Alex Chris at the helm as of September. The former Intuit executive has his work cut out for him in the new year. PayPal stock down more than 24% from a year ago with more on the path ahead for the payment giant. Let's turn now to Wedbush Securities Managing Director Moshe Khatri, along with Paul Golding, Macquarie Capital Senior Equity Research Analyst. And Moshe, I, I want to start with you because before we look forward, I want to look back a little bit because Dan Schulman, you know, built the company for a long time into what it is now and what it could potentially become, what do you see as his legacy, especially given that the end of his tenure was, you know, did see a decline in the shares? Well, happy new year. And to you. Um, <laughs> so a couple of things. I would say that Dan has uh, really gone through some pretty uh, tough hurdles, uh, anywhere from a prolonged uh, uh, headwinds from uh, transitioning away from eBay um, having to go through a normalization phase of e-commerce growth from very high pre-pandemic levels. Um, and you know what? He did build a hell of a company that would, that has a very strong uh, two-sided platform, one servicing merchants. It's very sticky. Um, and then the other one servicing roughly about 400 consumers, 400 million consumers. And that's also relatively sticky. Um, I'm just going to end this, what I have to say with one sentence, and I think it's really important here. What PayPal has gone through in the past year and a half is really a symptom of pretty much every single fintech company in this universe. You cannot exclusively rely on transaction fees in terms of revenue generation. You have to do more than that. And this is really the challenge for the incoming CEO building a very robust value-added services on both sides of the platform. So, Paul, I, I want to bring you in here as well. And Moshe talked about um, the new CEO there. and There's a new man in charge, Alex Chris, comes over from Intuit, Paul, and he, he's outlined some of his priorities already. He talks about uh, customer experience. He talks about margin expansion, Paul. I just want to know, do, do you think he's outlining the right priorities in your opinion? Well, as you mentioned, uh, the three key priorities that we highlighted from the prior earnings call were uh, investing in the consumer experience, uh, growing margin, particularly around the uh, unbranded brain-free product and transaction margin, and uh, also emphasizing the SMB, the small and medium business uh, cohort, particularly through PPCP, the PayPal uh, Complete Payments Platform, which is uh, tailored to SMBs. Uh, in, in terms of those priorities, we talk about this in our research, the, the user interface and customer experience. Uh, Dan Schulman invested in this uh, over the course of his tenure. So we'll be curious to see what Alex Chris comes in and does that uh, reinvigorates this uh, relative to what we've seen prior. 
and what has been done consistently. Um, on transaction margin, as was discussed prior in the segment, uh, as unbranded volumes continue to, to outpace branded, uh, this transaction margin headwind uh, it continues to be a, a tough uh, hurdle to, to overcome in terms of seeing transaction margin momentum go to the upside and see expansion. So uh, the volumes uh, are good, but uh, the transaction margin does see pressure from that. And then lastly, on the SMB front, we've seen SMB platforms focus on this cohort we cover Block. Uh, Block has uh, historically been very SMB focused. So this isn't necessarily revolutionary in our view as we've seen uh, other platforms uh, go after this cohort on software and services sell through as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how PayPal leverages its scale uh, and recognition in the marketplace to maybe do more with these themes that have been uh, worked through already to some extent. Um, and so, Moshe, do, are you confident that, that Alex Chris can overcome some of those transaction fee challenges? Are you optimistic about his leadership now at PayPal? And, and this is where his background could be pretty instrumental, given what he's done in, in his past life with on the SMB space. So that's number one. Um, and given the fact that you really have to build or rebuild um, an ecosystem of products and services servicing uh, facing both the merchant side of the business and the consumers. And if he's able to do that, uh, I think you, you're you going to have a pretty uh, pretty stable business that, that has a sticky model on both sides. And you should be able to, at least hypothetically, given the fact that you will be relying less on transaction volumes, um, you should be able to, to address the margin compression issue that they've had for about a year and a half now. And Paul, I also want to talk about competition in this space because, you know, obviously PayPal has a lot of it. It's everyone from uh, Apple to Shopify. What are, in that fight, Paul, what are PayPal's competitive ad advantages as you see it? Well, scale, they most recently reported 428 million uh, actives and uh, they've got about 35 million uh, merchant accounts, which is uh, substantial scale relative to the competition. They also have uh, something that, while others have this as well, uh, they don't necessarily have it at the same scale that PayPal has, which is a merchant side of the house and a consumer side of the house. And to marry those ecosystems as they uh, have done for, for quite some time and continue to do with uh, various discovery tools that, that uh merge those ecosystems and allow for retargeting and promotion, uh, that all helps drive this uh, ecosystem flywheel that can drive margin, drive inflows, uh, and help uh, boost their overall margin profile. And guys, before we go, I want to ask you both what your top picks in the sector are. We've been focusing on PayPal, obviously, with a little bit of talk about Block also. So Moshe, I'll start with you. What's your top pick? Um, I'll give it to you in a second. I just want to add one more thing in sure. terms of what's also unique for PayPal's merchants business, which is a conversion rate. Um, PayPal's uh, merchant platform is very stable and very sticky, given the fact that merchants that actually use the PayPal button have very high conversion rates. And that's why the, it's been so sticky. Um, we've been, in general, pretty defensive on the space. And uh, for example, we like the networks. We like Visa. And then we also like some of the um, more legacy merchant processors. I would include their uh, Pfizer Global Payments. And then the last one is PayPal. And what about you, Paul? Uh, we're outperform on the space as well. Uh, we like the networks as well, but top pick block probably at this point, just given the um, the inflection point here on cost outs and what we might see uh, in terms of overall uh, trajectory of, of that margin expansion potential relative to a more mature platform like PayPal. All right, Moshe, Paul, thank you guys both for joining today. Appreciate the time and the insight there. Thanks. Coming up next here, we have uh, a round table. And Josh Schaefer, I'm gonna throw it to you, my friend, to tell me what's coming. Hey Josh, yeah, next on the Yahoo Finance group chat, we are gonna be talking about TikTok and some top trends we're seeing there. TikTok gonna be competing with Amazon. We'll have all that coming for you next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Anjali Kimlani, along with Josh Schaefer and Brooke De Palma. Today, we're starting with Weight Watchers, the stock tanking after Eli Lilly unveiled a direct-to-consumer product. The company also warning weight loss drugs should not be used for cosmetic reasons. I so, mean, lots of takeaways I mean, there. Awesome. I listen, to listen. I have to just say, those two seem like they're not related, but they definitely are, okay? Let's take a look at one part of it, right? Eli Lilly coming out with direct-to-consumer, something that no drug company really has done. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing it? Well, they could be trying to uh, kind of wrap their arms around what has been going on, which is med spas and the like, you know, really getting their products out there in maybe illegal format sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe unsafe format sometimes. So I think this is one of those ways that the drug company is trying to combat that. Also, a point someone made to me was that it's a cash pay product essentially at this point, right? Fewer and fewer insurers are covering it. Uh, their Medicare product coverage is kind of low. So it really opens the door to get more customers in mm -hmm at a time when they're really under pressure. Yeah, and, and they're saying if other people are doing it, then we're gonna do it as well. And Eli Lilly sort of saying that, okay, this is not for cosmetic reasons, but we've seen them benefit from this. I was taking a look at, you know, we've been covering this closely. And if you take a look at Eli Lilly's Q3 2023 revenue, 1.4 billion, yep. that's up 0 0.19 billion in Q3 of 2022. So it has, their revenue has jumped dramatically year over year and largely because of these weight loss drugs. And can you imagine how much they're missing Missing out on because of supply demand right now, mm -hmm. right? There's way more demand than supply. It's just interesting to say it's not for cosmetics, but then what the market just told us, I would say Weight Watchers is largely for cosmetics, right? And so to see that stock react and be down 10%, Investors took that to mean something else. And I, we were talking about this story earlier today. And the thing that stuck out to me about prescription weight loss over the last week, these commercials on TV. I feel like you can't avoid them anymore. I've watched a fair amount of football, and I've been watching football on ESPN over the past week. ESPN's been running a lot of commercials from this company, Row, which is offering prescription, er, prescription yep. weight loss drugs, and they make it look so easy. That's the yeah. thing that sticks out to me. It reminds me of like a Weight Watchers type ad, yeah. where it just looks very simple. It's a simple solution, sort of counter to what Eli Lilly was saying in that. Well, yeah. it's, and it's been easy for these digital health companies like Roe, like Hims and Hers, like Weight Watchers to be able to capitalize on this focus on weight loss, right? right? So mm -hmm. while their product may not be focused on that, there's so many companies that are sort of like eating around the edges of this GLP-1 boom. Yeah. And I think that it's gonna be interesting to see how the companies battle that, how Weight Watchers battles now Eli Lilly's entry into being in a space where Weight Watchers has mm -hmm. traditionally been right yeah. they're typically the front point the entry point for these consumers and so now does Eli Lilly get a piece of it yeah. do they get more brand awareness because of it because we know pharma is just traditionally hated so I mean may maybe this is you know good branding all around <laughs> right right certainly lots of momentum heading into the new year and Weight Watchers taking a hit today but Food also a major focus of this all, and I'm closely watching, uh, closely watching groceries. One of the biggest gauges, though, that we saw in 2023, we're taking with us in 2024. Eggflation. Now, Cal Maine, the biggest egg producer here in the U.S., says profit fell 90 percent from a year ago as egg prices came down, but. There's a catch. Higher prices could be on the horizon as a result of a recent outbreak of the bird flu. Now, this outbreak did happen at one of their Kansas facilities. We now know that the direct impact of that was roughly 3% of its total bird, uh, total flock, so its total egg laying hens, and that roughly accounts for 1.5 million birds. So that really is a significant number. Calmaine is the top egg producer here in the U.S., and many worried that this could be a trickle effect of higher egg prices that we could see in the near future. Do we care? I mean, I mean, I don't know. Do we you have this conversation? I care. I care. <laughs> I, I, I care. I wonder at what point, though, we're past the inflation story of, mm. oh, no, it's coming back. Right. Oh, no, it's coming back. It's going to go back up to 350, as we just showed in that graphic we had on our screen of what eggs cost last year, yeah. right? Maybe they're just never going back to $1.14 like they right. were in 2019, right? right. $1.14 is pretty cheap for eggs. Yeah. Maybe that's just not coming back, but it doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden going to have to pay six or seven bucks for eggs at like we, we were seeing at some places, right, depending on where you live and sort of if you're buying organic, non-organic. I, I just think at some point, maybe it's, it's just okay and like it's not going to be that big of a deal. That's I don't know. That's how, I view, that's, that's how I'm viewing the growth. Yeah. I mean, do... 
do you think that there will be more of a push for a non-organic egg then? Because if someone is, I mean, if you're if you're really watching your expenses and if you really want to be healthy, right, you're going to look at the organic prices and you're going to probably pick the lower end of that. Is that four bucks? Is it five bucks? And then does that initial dollar or so really give you the motivation to walk away and then go to non-organic? Yeah, and there's so many things to consider when you think about this egg production, you know, industry. I mean, you're thinking of the feed for the hens, you're thinking of the soil, you're thinking of so many different things that's needed in order to do this. And many experts that I've spoke to over the past year is that this is a volatile, uh, you know, volatile item. Mm -hmm. This will continue to change year over year. But with this bird flu being an impact, this has been more volatile than usual. So one to watch, certainly. Buying eggs, something we're focusing on. Maybe you'll do it on TikTok <laughs> soon. Oh, Moving on to our next story. News coming out. Bloomberg reporting that they think the social media network TikTok could be coming at Amazon for its e-commerce business. Bloomberg estimating that they think TikTok could create a $17.5 billion e-commerce business. We know TikTok shop, as we're showing here, has become more and more popular. Influencers on the social media platform essentially showing you products, saying, look at this product, look at how great it is. Click on the link, yeah. buy it. It makes sense. We've seen Meta have success with it through Instagram yeah. and Facebook. TikTok wanting to build it out. I think the overall framing here was sort of fascinating to me. Bloomberg sort of highlighting, could they be coming for some of Amazon's business? Of course, when we think e-commerce, they're sort of the giant. Yeah, and what's fascinating about this is TikTok Shop didn't launch too long ago. It only launched mm. in September. And for them to sort of come out and say, we're going to get ahead of this. We are the new player and we're going to take share from Amazon. Certainly very optimistic, very front forward in their strategy here, really what they're looking to do. And ByteDance, the parent company, already winning in other international countries from these shops. Well, I just wonder how much of it is going to be really an Amazon uh, play versus, mm. to your point, meta, right? Mm. We We've seen how advertising uh, in, within social media plays with Instagram. Guilty. I've definitely bought things I shouldn't have, <laughs> right? And so I don't know that it necessarily, uh, maybe with the large enough market, with the, that global sort of population tuned in, I don't know. Do you think we're, we're so using it, the social point, media It's a good point, right? Way? Because I buy different things off Instagram than I would buy off Amazon, right? Amazon, I feel like I go to to buy something I know I need. Mm -hmm. Right, you go to right. Amazon to buy something Very like specific. a household good, something like that. The stuff I buy off TikTok, I did not know I needed it until I was on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Right, like, so I, like I, I, I didn't bought know a I second this, screen off it. TikTok last month. I wasn't sure how it was gonna work. I bought it for my mom. She loves it. Were you scared about putting in your like? I, I was moderately concerned, right? Uh, putting in yeah. something different. Of course, there's concerns with TikTok when it comes to China and security, and I went ahead and did it. It seems to have gone fine a month later. I don't know long term, but that, that's sort of how I got introduced yeah. to Instagram buying too, right? When I first did it, I was like buying something off social media feels weird. Yeah. And then they sort of just get you to feel comfortable with it, I guess. That's after true. Time. Quick hot take here. This reminds me of QVC. Josh didn't even know what that was when I told him, believe it or <laughs> oh my not. Gosh. But really that content led commerce, people yeah. looking online, getting a feel for how it works true. and then buying it. We'll Q teach you about Q Q Q QVC. 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 All right. No I'll look it up on TikTok. <laughs> Gen Z Google, right? All right, but coming up, we are going to bring you what to watch tomorrow. We break down the stories you need to know to start your Friday.
Time now for to watch Friday, January 5th, the big data point for the day, the December jobs report, of course. The last look at the labor market from 2023 out tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Economists expect the economy to have added 170,000 jobs, which would be a decline from November. The unemployment rate, meanwhile, expected to go up to 3.8%. The Fed, we know, keeps a close eye on the latest data as it decides potential rate cuts in 2024. And moving on to the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond President Tom Barkin speaking tomorrow after the jobs data release. Barkin giving more insight on the Fed's economic outlook after saying earlier in the week that a soft landing is, quote, in no way inevitable. And finally, on the earnings front, Constellation Brands reporting third quarter earnings. And before we say goodbye to him tomorrow, of course, for our ongoing series, Goodbye or Goodbye, where we mm -hmm. help you navigate the best moves for your portfolio, Julie. And then in terms of other things that I am watching, something that we have been talking mm -hmm. a lot about is the pending approval or not from the Securities and Exchange Commission for a spot Bitcoin ETF. Now, there are uh, a dozen or so issuers that have applied for approval. January 10th is seen as the deadline for when we start, might start to get those approvals and that we will likely get a bunch at once. I've been talking to some of the issuers trying to figure out what all of this looks like and when there's approval, it doesn't mean it's going to start trading right away. There's probably going to be a little bit of a digestion period. We'll learn about the fees on the various ETFs, but it should be a very interesting time in that space. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, you look back at Bitcoin, it was such a rough 2022, but then you looked at a great 2020, 2023, and different tailwinds. I mean, some of it was, you know, just risk on sentiment. That's always going to benefit Bitcoin. But another big part was this, this expectation yes, that you were going to green light this spot, Bitcoin ETF, and in yes. will come billions, Julie. Right. And I mentioned January 10th, but yeah. we might start to get, what I'm hearing is, we might start to get sort of a trickle of news ahead of that. You know, are there, uh, is there other information the SEC is requesting from these firms, for example, that we might see them start to provide over the next few days? Does that give us a signal as to what we're going to see? So I'll be looking for that kind of over the weekend period. And then if you and then when you get to the when you get the green light, I guess again then the real competition starts as you try exactly. to choose between these different products, of course, fees will be a fees big reason. Fees will there. be yeah. part of it. It'll be kind of what kind of network do these various uh, companies have already with financial advisors, with institutions out there, what kind of uptick might they get based upon that? That's gonna be part of the race as well. Um, so it's uh, you know We'll see. All right, and finally, big uh, big jobs report tomorrow. Yeah. A couple different nuggets. Talks. One would be wage growth. Yes. We always make a beeline for that. I thought it was interesting. ADP today, by the way, said wage growth actually slowed last mm. month. So job stayers, so workers who stayed in their jobs, saw salaries rise 5.4% from a year ago. Cooler than the month prior. We'll see what we get tomorrow. Yes, we will. And that kind of segues with the uh, jolt data we got yep. earlier this week, too. That'll do it today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.